So you've decided to go to the dog park with your dog and now before you go, you want to make sure you're equipped with the right information to make sure that your dog has the right experience. In this video, we're going to talk about what stress signals and what stress looks like in the dog park specifically and what you can expect from not just your dog, but the other dogs in the park and what would be considered normal. Make sure you keep watching. What's up guys, it's Jenna with Dog Liaison where I coach you on how to enhance your dog's mental health and on this channel we break down scientific research in order to inform and educate us on how to train dogs. Recently I posted a video on the pros and cons of dog parks. So that video was more about making sure whether your dog is the right fit for dog parks. So now assuming that you've decided your dog is the right dog for the dog park and you want to take your dog there, make sure you watch this video first. I think that uh, this video is going to be very enlightening for you on what you can expect once you're inside the park. We're gonna talk about what signs of stress you can expect from within the park, not just from your dog, but from all of the dogs in the park. Now, as always, we take an evidence-based approach in this channel, and so we like to make sure that everything that we uh, have an opinion on is founded in some form of science. And so I reached out to Dr. Carolyn Walsh and Dr. Rita Anderson of the Canine Research Unit in Memorial University in Newfoundland. And these two researchers have done, and their students and their whole unit, uh, have done a lot of research in dog parks specifically over the last 15 years. And so I would argue that if there were ever two experts to speak with about dog parks specifically, it would be these two lovely ladies. They were very kind and willing to sit down with an interview and go over their research, go over their data with me. And I have posted that entire interview uh, in my channel and so if you're interested in watching that and getting all of the information in a much more uh, in-depth look I recommend you check out that video this video is going to be about specifically the stress that you might find in the dog. I think it's important first before we jump too far in that we define what stress is because I know that stress tends to have a negative connotation. People seem to assume that stress is inherently bad and it's important that we recognize from a scientific standpoint stress is neutral. It's not good or bad. Stress just means some sort of effort that was required and so that's one of the reasons why it's acceptable and reasonable to assume that you would find stress in the dog park because uh, there's a lot of variables that would require more effort. Anything from exercise to novelty in the dog park um, is going to require effort and so is going to require stress. Also from a scientific standpoint, stress can be viewed from two different perspectives. It can be viewed from a behavioral standpoint which is more of like, what can you visibly see the dog doing? What is the action the dog is doing that indicates stress? And then it can also be measured from a hormonal level through cortisol. And I'm gonna let Dr. Walsh explain what cortisol is. Cortisol is, most of us think of cortisol as a stress hormone. And we have cortisol, humans have cortisol, dogs have cortisol. Anyways, it's a glucocorticoid hormone that gets released from our adrenal glands or dog's adrenal glands um, in response to a stressor. At the time, we used it because it's a common uh, hormone that was easily measured in saliva. While it's easy to get the values for um, cortisol, it's the interpretation of what cortisol means that is sometimes more challenging. So we have established that you can view stress from a behavioral standpoint or from an internal hormonal standpoint from within the dog. And the interesting part about these two different perspectives is that they don't always correlate. And what I mean by that is you might have a behavior which indicates stress but from a hormonal level, the cortisol is not indicating an increase, a significant increase in stress. Conversely, you might have a high cortisol or a really, really low cortisol, but visibly on the outside, there's no behavior indicating stress. Now, I know that this fact, the fact that the behavior of stress and the stress hormone don't necessarily happen at the exact same time and do not have a strong correlation is pretty 
confusing. It doesn't make sense. Um, and I think from a reasonable human standpoint, we're all looking at that having doubts, right? Um, but one thing that I can tell you is that from a scientific literature standpoint, as it pertains to dogs specifically, this is widely accepted. The fact that cortisol and stress behaviors do not always run side by side tangently has been seen in data all the way back to 1998. And I know that from a dog trainer standpoint, I can tell you that's really frustrating. The fact that we can't necessarily look at behavior and say, okay, that means that stress hormone is higher. That's incredibly frustrating as a trainer. Um, and so instead of thinking of the behavior is more important and the cortisol is more important, I don't want you to necessarily give too much significance to either one. Uh, let's look at them on equal playing fields. Uh, depending on the context, behavior might be more important or depending on the context, cortisol might be more important. So if you're enjoying this nerdy standpoint so far, if you are with me, if you're like, wow, I gotta figure out why these two stresses don't go together, make sure you hit like um, and let's get into it. So let's start off with some of the stress signal behaviors, the actions that a dog might do that indicate some of stress. And I did a whole four part series on stress behaviors um, that I recommend you check out. I will put them all over here. But I would say especially this one is relevant to what we're talking about today. So after this video, you can check out that one. But some of the relevant behaviors that you might see would be things like a lip lick, uh, where the dog is licking their lips or raising their paw, or um, maybe one of those big stretches that kind of imitate a play bow, right? Um, maybe a yawn. Some of these more subtle stress signals or some behaviors that might indicate stress, um, but not necessarily bad stress. Now, one of the papers by the Canine Research Unit that was published in 2013 um, by Ottenheimer Carrier et al., uh, they published that of their dogs that they observed, 98% of the dogs displayed at least one or more stress signals. 98%. That is an astronomical amount. So what do we make of that? Do we assume that 98% of the dogs that go to the dog park are just all completely stressed out and inevitably they're gonna have a panic attack and there's gonna be problems and oh my gosh? No, <laughs> absolutely not. And the reason is, is because these stress signal behaviors are not automatically bad. We cannot assume that the lip lick is inherently bad, is inherently the dog is overwhelmed. Um, we know that these behaviors are plentiful and that we need to make sure that we are expecting them. And I think that's one of the things that we can deduce from this data is that when you go to the dog park, anticipate that you will see stress signals. Anticipate that you will see your dog and the dogs in the park yawning, raising their paw, stretching. They're, they're gonna give those things. And what I want you to do is not give too much weight to them. When you see those stress signals, do not automatically think, oh my God, all of these dogs are upset, all of, this do all of these dogs are uncomfortable and inevitably bad things are gonna happen. That's not the conclusion you wanna draw. You wanna go in knowing likely you're gonna see some stress signals, but we need to make sure that we're staying objective about it and looking at it within context. And you especially wanna keep it within context given that we know that these stress behaviors, these paw lifts, these uh, you know, very subtle cues of stress are not significantly correlated with higher cortisol, at least that's not proven by the canine research unit. The only posture, the only visible action that was significantly corresponding to higher cortisol is the hunched posture. That is when the dog might be curling his, his shoulders over his head, his hind legs might be a little bit higher than his front legs, so he might look a little off. Effectively, the dog is lower to the ground. According to this data, that hunched posture was often accompanied by um, the tucked tail and runaway behaviors. So, but don't, again, this goes back, 
do not apply too much significance to that moment. You need to look at it within the context. Now, if the dog continues to give a bunch of hunched posture over and over and over again for a bunch of different things, if he's hiding behind your legs and he's scrunched over and or he's trying to hide underneath benches, like take the dog out of the park because now not only is he responding in fear behavior, but probably he has higher cortisol. But if you just see it once and then pretty, there's a soon quick recovery and the dogs start playing again, do not overwhelm yourself. Do not get so focused in your brain where you're like, oh my God, but Jenna said that the hunched posture means higher cortisol. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Keep it within context. You're collecting information. You're using your eyes and you're observing everything and putting it together on the whole. Now, one of the suggestions about this hunched posture in the, from other trainers has suggested that this hunched posture is a submissive pose and that in fact, when you see a dog do this position, it is a healthy thing because it's acting as a way to sort of de-escalate some sort of um, confrontation or some sort of issue between one dog and another. Um, and so I asked, uh, Dr. Carolyn Walsh and Dr. Rita Anderson about that specific question. I wanted to see is this hunched position correlated or providing some sort of function of submission? And this is what they said. So that's a big controversy. That's probably even more controversial than the dog park. Should I go to the dog park? <laughs> this is another talk. <laughs> we do not actually have the data. We have very rich interpretation yeah. out there of yes. a particular form of behavior, but we do not have the empirical evidence about how other dogs are responding to yeah. that postural information yeah. um, or how that dog then is subsequently responding. Yeah. And mm -hmm. we need it. We yeah. desperately need it. The way I always like to describe it is like, okay, well, those are hypotheses about why a dog is doing something. Now you need data. I'm not convinced based on the literature, and this goes beyond just the dog park literature, obviously, that, um, that the hunch posture is necessarily any kind of sign of submission to another dog. And in fact, the hunch posture may just be this stress reaction, if you want, this fear reaction, um, that there's no necessarily, it's not necessarily, we don't have to ascribe a ten, intention that the yeah, dog is yeah, doing this yeah. to get other dogs to leave him alone. That's what's happening. Um, it may have the effect of getting other dogs to leave him alone. And, you know, so that might work. Um, and maybe there is intention, but that's also a really hard thing to study. We're not there yet. Yeah, we're not um, there yet. Yeah. And I, Nobody's there yet, I think, not just us. But. Now, in addition to the hunched posture correlating with higher cortisol, it also correlated with more neurotic personality types in dogs. Now, it's important that we distinguish what neurotic means. It doesn't necessarily mean that the dog doesn't like dogs or that the dog is reactive to people. It just means that the dog is a little bit more high strung. Maybe maybe a little bit more anxious, maybe a little bit more antsy, right? It's also important that we acknowledge that we didn't just pull out these adjectives out of thin air. It wasn't that we just, you know, look at the dog and go, oh, it looks like he's neurotic. There's actually a process that researchers go through in order to, to, to scientifically label a dog. So the MCPQR stands for the Monash canine personality questionnaire revised. It really is just a list of 26 adjectives that would describe a dog and the owners only have to rate it on a scale of one to six. On a sliding scale, how much does this describe your dog? And in the development then of the, this test, what they found is that these adjectives can be grouped into five sort of constructs um, that this um, test will describe a dog on. And we usually just, you know, give them percentages, right? So it's not like we're trying to put dogs in boxes and then um, made sure that it was valid and reliable. So one of the challenges sometimes is like, we all know we can go on the internet and find personality tests or quizzes, right? You know, for ourselves and for our dogs and cats and whatever. Um, but what we're using is actually what we would call a psychometric valid and reliable tool. So it's gone through processes, for example, of um, testing and retesting. So Oddenheimer and Gary et al. found in their research that when you have a neurotic dog, they're more likely to have increased cortisol. So what does that mean for you? From my own interpretation from this data, I don't think that means that 
neurotic dogs shouldn't go to the dog park. I think that they can still have very reasonable, fun engagements there. Uh, but I think it means that you're gonna have to take a little bit more precaution if you have a neurotic dog versus maybe a more amicable uh, dog, right? Um, if you've got a neurotic dog, you're probably going to have to be a little bit more methodical, a little bit more strategic than say someone else with another type of personality dog. So if you have a more neurotic dog, some procedures you might want to put into place is first of all, I would minimize how many dogs you go to the dog park with. If you've got a very high strung, hyper focused dog, high drive dogs, um, and you put them in a situation where they are with, you know, 10 dogs, 15 dogs, that's going to be incredibly overstimulating. If you have a more neurotic dog, I think it's important that you are minimizing how many dogs are in the space at one time. I also think it's important that you are minimizing the amount of novelty just in general. Now, in that bit, in this video, I talked about um, sort of giving a procedure to introducing novelty and introducing new things. Uh, I think that would be important for a more neurotic dog. Um, I think that slowly introducing a new environment first, take him to the park first where he can explore and then introducing another dog and then introducing maybe a new toy or whatever. You're introducing it in, an implement, in a slow procedure. That's going to be far more efficient. And I think most importantly, you're going to have to make sure that your dog is self-regulating his excitability. Now, again, this is incredibly subjective. Um, being able to know your dog is important. Being able to intuitively know how your dog is, is um, behaving and is he still logical or is he too excitable, is he too hyper aroused, is going to be really important. Um, and if you see your dog as being silly and as ridiculous, like for example, huskies howl a lot when they play. And some person might interpret that as, uh, you know, too overwhelming or too spastic and you need to take that husky out. And then the owner might look at their husky and go, actually, that's relatively normal for him. He's nowhere near overstimulated. And so it's important that we are looking at the individuals. We are not just taking a fell sweep. And that is one of the most um, important lessons, I think, from this video, which is that we need to go in with an open mind. We need to make sure that we are not judging uh, the dog's behaviors based off of simply observing them. You have to look at the context. You have to look at it on the whole. Um, and so I would argue that if you're gonna go to a dog park, have an open mind as an owner. And if you're not able to have an open mind when you go in, maybe the dog park isn't the best place for you. So now just to recap what we have talked about in this video, the first thing is that stress-related behaviors like a lip lick, like a yawn, those are to be expected. Those are probably very, gonna be very common in the park. And I think that if you see them happening, do not give too much weight to it. You have to look at the frequency of those behaviors. There are other things you should probably be looking for. Most likely you should be looking for the hunched posture, which is correlated with higher cortisol, which is also correlated with a tucked tail and runaway behavior. So it's indicating that the dog is fearful or that the dog is uncomfortable at the very least. Um, so it's more that you wanna be looking for not exclusively a hunched posture but the hunched posture combined with some other stress signals combined with your dog just not behaving normally and guys this is such a small amount this is such an ounce of the wonderful work that the canine research unit has been able to do within dog parks so I cannot stress to you enough how much I love talking about this how much I thoroughly enjoyed uh, interviewing uh, the, the professors and it has just been a very rewarding little project for me. Uh, I would talk about it all day long, but I'll keep it short. If you are looking for a deeper dive, I really recommend you check out this video. And um, if you are interested in understanding the pros and cons and deciding whether or not your dog is the right fit for dog parks, I recommend you check out this video. If you enjoyed this one, make sure you hit like, consider subscribing, and I'll see y'all soon.